Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here. Uh, we get a lot of requests to break down Paul Skeens, obviously one of the top pitchers in the country uh, at the collegiate level and obviously projected uh, top half of the first round pick, if not one of the first couple picks. Uh, pretty incredible the season he's been able to put together, pretty incredible stuff. I'm sure most of you guys have been following him through the highlights Pitching Ninja's been posting and other areas. So I just want to give my take on his mechanics, take on his arsenal, and show some of the things that, that I'm seeing. Again, just disclaimer, we don't work with him. Uh, however, I just kind of want to give my take because people seem to be interested. So as far as his velo progression, he was reportedly up to 95 his senior year of high school. Went to Air Force, was a two-way player, uh, up to 98 his freshman year, mid-upper 90s his sophomore year. At that point, he was listed at 6'6", six 235. Six, Transferred to LSU, uh, is primarily now focusing on pitching. He's listed at 6'6", six, six, 247. So he has put on about 12 pounds, according to that, in about a year. Uh, and now he's obviously sitting upper 90s, touching triple digits pretty regularly. He did specifically say that his body feels a lot better this year. You know, he, he just kind of mentioned the resources around him as part of that and the structure. Um, I do wonder if part of that is just not being not being two-way, not having the demand. And just having played with two-way guys at the collegiate level, it really is a, a huge demand on the body to have to go and you know try to balance both of those things. So I do wonder if, if part of that velo jump this year isn't a result of just being able to purely focus on on pitching and of potentially to the credit of the strength and conditioning staff and or nutrition staff at LSU uh, because he has put on weight again. And so he's, again, absolute monster. You can compare this to, you know, a Noah Syndergaard type body who's, he's listed 6'6", 242, and Skeen's here 6'6", 247. So he's an absolute monster that really does play into, into consideration here when examining his mechanics because he does have efficient mechanics. However, a 5'7", 160 pound pitcher with these exact patterns would not be throwing 102 miles an hour, 101 miles an hour. So it absolutely must be taken into account the physicality of a pitcher when analyzing their mechanics and whether or not you can give all the credit to how they move or some of that to their actual physicality, their levers, their, their strength and their power. Uh, he also mentioned just the, the overall lifestyle uh, being addressed at LSU. Obviously tougher, the general lifestyle at, at a military school like Air Force. Um, so he, he kind of mentioned, you know, his, his overall class workload, online classes, uh, just structure throughout the day, balance, sleep. He, he mentioned some of these things on a podcast. So again, I wonder if just his general recovery and stress levels are, are in a much better spot this year and that obviously potentially playing a role. And he also had really nice things to say about Wes Johnson. I'll go ahead and play that clip right now. And I think it's understated a really? little bit, like how, how important he is to the program. Pitching side, if he were just like a pitching coach, yeah. just teaching you how to you know throw the ball on the mound, you, I, I still think he'd be the best in the country. But honestly, I think his, his ability to read players and like work on the mental side of the game is, yeah. is even higher than the pitching side. And like for me, I, I would say that I'm, I'm pretty mature in that end. And it's been more like life stuff for me. Like that's awesome. Just how much he gets talked about is yeah. honestly. It's not even enough. It's, it's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, just how important he is to this program. So again, speaks very highly of him, calls him, you know, one of the best coaches he's been around. Um, but I think the important thing to, to pull out from that is, you know, he really emphasizes how Wes addresses uh, kind of the lifestyle aspect of it, you know, looking at it from kind of the, the whole person perspective, not just the throwing perspective. What are you doing outside the field, stress level, uh, mental game, right? It's not just mechanics, it's not just arsenal, um, but addressing that, that whole uh, kind of puzzle. And that's very much the approach that we, that we try to take with our guys as well, just recognizing that all these pieces interrelate and it's not simply a matter of giving guys a different pitch grip or giving guys a, a mechanical cue. If let's look at the entire puzzle together and see how these different pieces interact. So we can go ahead and go over the different pieces of his arsenal. Obviously he's known for his fastball. Uh, I've seen that graded as high as 80 on an 80 scale, which again, that's that would indicate that's like a Hall of Fame caliber pitch. You know, that might be a little overzealous. It might not be. We'll, we'll see how that pitch plays once he does ultimately make it into professional baseball and, and work his way through the ranks. But regardless, it's one of the best fastballs in college baseball in a long time. Metrically, right, it's not necessarily the super high carry fastball that someone like a Garrett Cole might have. Um, he actually is getting a good amount of carry considering the lower arm slot. And he's also getting a decent amount of arm side run as well. So it's kind of unique in that regard is that he's getting carry and this ride aspect to it, which is 
uh, fairly unique. I'm gonna comp that to 100 green fastball. It's one of the few major league fastballs that kind of has that combo of a little bit of arm side and a little bit of carry. Uh, although Skeens, I would argue, might be an even better pitch than 100 greens fastball. Uh, he does throw a sinker as well, which has very above average arm side run. Again, great pitch. And he's pairing that with a slider, which has really become his bread and butter pitch this year. Uh, last year, he explained on, on this one podcast uh, that I'll go ahead and link to down below that he was primarily throwing a gyro slider and he's traditionally had trouble getting pitches to move glove side because he is a pronator. He has a tendency towards pronation. He was able to tweak that grip and really just pick up a sweeper through experimentation uh, this past year. And now he's he's got one of the more elite sliders in college baseball and this is a pitch that would grade out very very well even at the big league level and so he's getting good amount of sweep he's throwing that pitch mid 80s and i'm going to comp that to a blake trinan slider known as one of the best sweepers in the big leagues and has very similar shapes and velocity to that slider so the reason that slider actually pairs so well with his arsenal is because again he does get that that arm side movement on both his four seam and his two seam and so he's able to create that kind of east to west profile He's got some carry to the fastball and some arm side, and then he's got some depth and some glove side. And so he's creating that kind of diagonal east to west separation between the slider and between the four seam. And so we can see here how he kind of tunnels those pitches. And then he actually has a changeup, which is very serviceable, but he just hasn't really needed to use it that much uh, at the collegiate level. That is a pitch he's probably going to have to break out a lot more should he ultimately get to the big league level. He probably will start to rely on that a little bit more. But again, serviceable pitch, some good depth, some good arm side and able to change speeds with that as well. So mechanically, I know that's why you guys are here for this video. Uh, first, I wanna kinda of break down his initial move because I think this is what really sets up the rest of the throw. Now we talk a lot about the drift here. We talk a lot about you know, setting tension through, uh, through the back side, through the back leg, uh, through that, that you know, connection point to the ground, the back foot. Um, we talk a lot about the head position, the eye position. And then we talk a lot about you know, the coil and whether certain guys should coil or certain guys shouldn't coil. And so again, these all kind of go hand in hand with the first move is, is there's a lot of, a lot of different moving parts going on here, right? It's not as simple as just lift your leg, move forward. So for him, we can start with the drift. You can see, again, it's a, it's a controlled forward move. He doesn't lose the back leg anchor, right? This is the problem when certain guys hear this term drift and they lift their leg and their head is immediately way out here. Right, they're drifting twice as much as Jacob deGrom drifts and they think they're they think that more is better. And the reality of the situation is that there is a very real sweet spot where you can get the train moving, where right? you can start to set some lateral angles, you can start to get on the inside of the back foot, but you don't lose the back leg. You don't ever lose that connection point uh, to the ground. You never feel like you're falling if you're drifting properly. And so he gets that subtle, you can see three, four inch weight shift. He gets that center of mass. We kind of look at the belly button as he moves forward. Where does that get, get him to? Boom, gets him about three, four, five inches forward, gets the weight shifted towards the inside of the back foot. And so now as he drops into his back leg, he's able to create more lateral angles into his center of mass because he's initiated with that drift. Now he does what a lot of hard throwers do at the big league level and he actually pairs that forward move with a little bit of a drop of his gaze. And so I've had a number of conversations with, with a number of different people, vision researchers, other pitching coaches, uh, tons of high level guys. And, and again, the jury is still out on exactly why this seems to work so well for certain guys. Um, my thinking, and, and as somebody who, who kind of figured this out for myself, that this was extremely helpful uh, from a command standpoint was that, again, it can be very hard to just kind of find focus on the target. Um, you know, from 10 seconds before you, you know, throw the pitch, get the sign, um, come set or begin the wind up, and you're just focusing, focusing, focusing the whole time on that one spot. Being able to just kind of drop the gaze back down, especially as you move forward, and then pick the target up again, is a much more natural, uh, natural feeling for a lot of guys. They, they don't have to hyper fixate on the target. They can pick it up, boom, I know where I'm throwing the ball, break the gaze for a second, pick it back up, and it's much more like an infielder feeling of all, and then you pick up the target, and it just is automatic. You're, you're working out, you're working more through the automatic part of your brain versus starting to get into the overthinking side of your brain. So for some guys, again, they can hyper fix it on the target the entire time, not break focus once. But for myself and for, I mean, maybe even 50% of higher level pitchers that, that, you know, they need to have 
some aspect of kind of like breaking that focus for a split second and then picking it back up. That seems to be really helpful. The other piece of it that, that might be the case is that during that forward move, during that drift, bringing the gaze down might be a way to gain a little bit of stability and avoid tipping uphill during that forward move. So it's possible as you move forward, and this also feels to be the case with myself uh, as I kind of learned and tried to figure out the drift for myself and, and eventually got it to click, is that it just felt natural bringing the gaze down as I move forward. It kind of set, you can see, kind of sets that, that shoulder angle initially dips a little bit. So he's got that little dip with the eyes going down, that little shoulder, uh, shoulder tilt. And again, pairing that with getting to the inside of the back foot, pairing that with that forward move. So it's, it's just kind of a paired, a paired movement that seems to go really well and naturally occur with a little bit of that, that subtle drift motion. So that's the first thing, cover the drift. I really like this glove tap that he's got. Again, there might be some critics that say, oh, the hitter you know, can see the grip or you know, at the big league level that won't play. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced of that. I, I do think that at this point, it's what's gonna give him the, the biggest bang for his buck as far as rhythm, repeatability, velocity, smoothness, fluidity, sequencing. And again, you'll see for a lot of guys, when you add in that glove tap, that can be a one, two, three mile an hour unlock for a significant amount of guys, just because of the effect it has on the overall sequencing of the chain. I've talked about this in the, the Jacob deGrom breakdown, um, where he came back after the 2020 season and he was like sitting 101. And, and it was like, what, what did he change? And that was really one of the main things that I could pick up is that he had added that glove tap. And it was just something so subtle that can just really have an effect on the overall sequencing, staying relaxed through the upper half, allowing the lower half to, to create tension and build and build and keeping the upper half, keeping the arm action relaxed through that process and timing it up properly with the lower half. So again, I'm a huge fan of the glove tap if that's something that, that does seem to work for a guy if, and at least playing around with it, right? It's something that with most guys, like at some point in the off season, hey, let's play around with back foot position, let's play around with the glove tap, let's play around with hands over the head. There's a few very simple things that over the course of a couple bullpens, hey, maybe nothing here works. Maybe it's just, you know, a little bit of trial and error. Maybe no nothing here is gonna stick, but maybe something here ends up being an unlock. And you can take that with you and pattern that for the off season and take that with you into the next season. And so for me, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that glove tap as far as gaining rhythm. And then the other piece of that first move is the coil. So he's an interesting case where he is getting he is getting some degree of coil, but he's actually continuing to intensify that coil as he moves forward. So it's not, you know, like a Josh Hader type of coil where all that coil happens by peak leg lift. Some of that coil happens, but then as he begins to move forward, you can see he continues to coil even more as he begins to drop into that backside. So it's a little bit unique, a little bit interesting and from that standpoint. And then the other piece of it, as we kind of come down to the back foot, is some of the angles that he's able to, that he's creating on the back foot. And so he comes set relatively even with the rubber and, you know, flat, evenly distributed on that back foot. But as he shifts forward and as he coils, that coil is producing a torque that's, again, going down through the ground He's trying to, he's torquing into the ground here with that coil. And so you see he actually does get a little bit of slippage of that back foot. And so now he's in 15, 20 degrees of slightly turned out back foot position. And you can see at times even that heel will come off the ground early, which is again, a little bit unique. You don't see this as much in the hardest throwers, but this, this is something that I've talked about before with, with our work with Clay Holmes, is that he had always been a guy it was a little bit more on the quad dominant side. He would get into his toe a little bit early and yet it worked for him. He would, he would be mid upper nineties in the minor league as a prospect throwing nasty sinkers. And somewhere along the way, you know, he was coached for whatever reason into keeping that heel down longer. And for him, that didn't work for him. He would get stuck. He couldn't get his hips open at landing and it ended up screwing everything else up further down the chain. And so for him, when he, he did come to us and, and ask us for our opinion, you know, we kind of recommended he get back to, despite it being, you know, controversial, get back to what he did when he was throwing his best. And for him, it was slightly getting into the toe, that heel came up a little bit early. And for him, it allowed his hips to clear a little bit better into landing. So some people might see this and say, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing that he's, his heel's coming up early. 
a team might draft him and say, you know, if we fix that, maybe he throws 105. And maybe they're right, but I've seen it go the other way. I've seen it go the other way where when a guy's figured it out, and I would say he's very, he is very close to having figured out his optimal movement for his frame. It's very difficult, very risky to start tweaking things like that because you actually don't know how it's going to affect everything else further up the chain. So again, interesting that he does come into the, the toe, not something that I think is a concern, not something that I would change. And you can see he gets a little bit of slippage of that back foot. Zoom in on the heel, you can see that back foot does turn. But again, this is fairly common with guys that have some degree of coil. Because again, you are really turning into the backside. The backside's only connection point to the ground is that back foot. And so as you place a rotational torque through the ground, through the back foot, it's common to get a little bit of slippage. And as long as it's somewhat repeatable and they're able to still create tension and they're able to still have a stable base from which to move forward, most guys that do that can get away with it. And it's, it's not necessarily an issue whatsoever, but again, just, just worth pointing out. But because of that, because of the fact that he does have that slightly turned out foot now as he gets into his lower half, as he actually drops into his backside, as he gets into the hinge, you can see that he's dealing with a little bit more of that vertical shin position. Again, not a, not a perfectly vertical shin, but a relatively vertical uh, shin angle. He's got a little bit of a positive shin angle, but he's not, he's not sitting there with a super positive shin angle. And so that's going to be correlated to the position of the back foot. The more turned out the back foot, the more vertical that shin angle will be as a response to that. So again, that's something to specifically figure out for yourself is what back foot position allows me to create the most tension and stability through this entire uh, back leg chain. So from, from the pelvis, through the back hip, through the tibia, and through the ground. Again, something very easy to test in the off season, one bullpen five, 10 pitches with your foot turned out slightly, foot even with the rubber, and then either hooking the rubber, emphasizing the inside of the back foot, which you can see gets to the inside of the back foot very well, or turning the toes in ever so slightly. And so it's something that's very easy to test in a bullpen setting and figure out what's the optimal orientation to create that tension through the lower half. So let's get into the stride now. There are a lot of people who will preach ultra long strides, right? And I think he's a great example of how that's not entirely necessary to still produce elite velocities because he's not extending down the mound. You can see that he's, he's loading, he's creating tension, and then he's rotationally unloading that tension into landing. And he's sending that up the chain, creating this very late tornado of energy that winds its way up the chain from the pelvis to the torso, out and around into the arm. Right, and so he's not, he's not sitting here jumping, leaping down the mound, doing towel drills, trying to hit a bucket, trying to get his release way out here, right? He's creating tension, creating stability and tension through the backside. He's riding a closed pelvis down the mound, closed pelvis, closed pelvis, closed pelvis, closed pelvis. And now he uncorks it last second, pops the hips open and sends that tornado of energy up the chain. And because his upper half is in this stacked position, right? He's, he's got a relatively uh, neutral uh, rib cage position. He's stacked over the pelvis. As he unloads, he can send that energy up into the arm, right? You're not gonna see that for a guy who's landing with his shoulders way uphill or whose head is way out front or who's leaning way back towards first base or he's caving way forward or he's staying over top of his pelvis. He's, another way of saying that is he's keeping his pelvis underneath him so that as he pops the hips through, his trunk is in a position to actually accept that rotation and send that tornado of energy up the chain. His arm is also in a position to where the energy can actually work its way out and around in that plane of rotation and get as much of that as possible into the arm and ultimately out and around into the ball. So could somebody say his arm is a fraction of a second late? Somebody could make that argument, but I'd have a hard time buying that argument. He's, he's within the ranges that we look for we would typically be looking for somewhere in the realm of 45 to 90 degrees of external rotation at this point. So relatively on time would be somewhere in this window. And again, he hits that window. If he was landing with his forearm completely horizontal or even you know, below horizontal, right? Maybe that's an issue. Maybe that's a sign that his 
arm isn't in a position to accept that that layback, accept that violent rotation that's about to come. But you can see he's in a pretty good position. He's right around 90 degrees of elbow flexion, potentially a little bit inside. And as he rotates, his arm spirals out and around into ball release, again, releasing relatively close to full elbow extension and in the plane of rotation. So he's, he's unleashing that tornado out and around in plane of rotation. And so that's how you ultimately produce the highest velocities is you get everything in the same plane of rotation. One interesting thing about him, and again, this goes back to the fact that he is a very physical guy. He doesn't have to necessarily create his velocity from absurd ranges of motion as far as crazy hip shoulder separation, because he's already applying that force over a long range of motion due to his lever lengths. He's already applying a crap ton of power due to how strong and powerful he is. And so he doesn't have to be a Tim Linscombe type guy that's creating outrageous hip shoulder separation. And you kind of see that. You see that with a lot of uh, elite guys who, you know, they rely on their physicality versus necessarily getting into crazy deep ranges of motion. The Shohei Otanis of the world aren't creating crazy separation. Um, you know, thinking back to Syndergaard when he threw 100, wasn't creating crazy separation. So it's definitely possible to throw hard without creating elite separation. And that's especially the case for guys that are extremely physical. And so you can see if we go to landing right here, again, he's staying reasonably close. It's plenty, plenty to be able to throw 100 miles an hour with his physicality. But again, it's just worth pointing out that not everybody needs to be creating these outrageous hip shoulder separations to produce 100 miles an hour. Maybe a, maybe a five foot eight pitcher throwing 100 miles an hour does need to compensate in other areas because they aren't gonna have the lever length on their side. They're not gonna have some of the other aspects on their side. So they're gonna have to get it elsewhere to still produce comparable velocities. But again, just pointing out, especially if you're a bigger, more physical guy, tighter wound guy, it's not a black or white conversation as far as more hip shoulder separation always equals better. It's really about the overall sequencing of the throw and how you transfer energy from segment to, to segment through your body. So let's now talk a little bit about his, his arm action. And he's a guy who obviously has a little bit of a shorter, more compact arm path. And I'm definitely not against shorter arm paths. I, def I don't think that you know coaches should automatically be changing everyone to a shorter arm path just because they have you know a mild flexor strain or you know uh, UCL injury. I don't, I don't think that everyone needs to be chasing this fad of short arm actions all the time, but I'm not against short arm actions. And certainly uh, the key takeaway here is that if an arm action is fluid, it's continuous, it's synced up with the lower half and it's on time. Those are really the commonalities of an efficient arm action. And so he puts on display what a, a shorter, more compact arm action really can be, and he makes it work. And so this absolutely is not something that, that should be changed. Um, you can see that, again, it's, it's a continuous loop. It's a continuous arm spiral, despite being a little bit on the shorter end. Again, arm relatively on time here. It's within an acceptable range. And he ends up delivering from a little bit of a lower arm slot. Um, despite the lower arm slot, he actually has a release height, which is you know, around a, around a normal a normal range, around six foot uh, release height. So it's actually not a super low release height, but that's more of a product of just, you know, how big of a dude he is, how tall he is, that he's not releasing from, you know, the five foot range. But a shorter pitcher with a lower slot like this would typically have that flatter vertical approach angle working on their side. However, just because of his velocity, his, his decent carry, his fastball profile, he's still able to easily get above barrels with his four seam fastball. So that's not really a concern at this point, and certainly, hasn't held him back one bit in college. If we look at the toe landing. This is another uh, another thing. Again, it's more pronounced in certain videos. This video here on the right, he actually lands fairly uh, fairly evenly on the foot. I'll put another video here on screen where you can see how sometimes he does actually land on the toe first. However, I don't necessarily think this is an issue because it, it really comes down to, it's more of a continuum, it's more of a spectrum than Toe landing is good, toe landing is bad, heel landing is good, heel landing is bad. If the upper half gets way too far out over the lower half, then you're gonna have a pretty excessive toe landing. And that's usually just an indicator of the trunk stack uh, not being maintained, the trunk not staying over top of the pelvis. If you have an excessive heel landing, generally that happens when the upper half is way too far back. The head might be way back here at landing. And so 
as a response, the heel landing is going to be when the upper half is way too far back. The toe landing will be an issue when the upper half is way too far forward. But a subtle landing on the toe for a half half a frame and then the, the full foot lands and stabilizes or slightly landing on the heel and then a half frame later, the full foot stabilizes. Again, there's so many examples of big leaders that do that and they're in an acceptable range as far as that trunk positioning. And you can see he's got a, you know, a little bit on the forward side as far as the trunk positioning, a little bit a little bit forward. But again, it's within that acceptable range. There's plenty of 100 mile an hour throwers who are in these types of positions. That to me, that's not a concern to seeing that at times he gets a little bit into the toe at landing. Uh, again, it's really just when you see these excessive lack of trunk stack where you'll get that extreme toe landing which can impact the ability to stabilize the lead leg or that extreme heel landing where you get kind of this jarring sensation through the lower half. So again, not a concern from, from my standpoint. If we look at some other things he does really well, uh, the lead leg block is what you would expect for a 100 mile an hour thrower. So as soon as he plants, again, full foot stabilizes. And then if we take a look at the kneecap, take a look at the patella, you can see there's no forward movement from that point on. So lead leg stabilizes and able to accelerate that pelvic rotation around that stable, stable lead leg, around that stable front foot and deliver the arm. And if we look at it from a back view, we also like to see, okay, does that knee not only stabilize in an anterior to posterior direction, does it stabilize front to back, but does it stabilize side to side, east to west as well? And so we wouldn't want to see that knee continue to shoot out and around towards first base. And you can see it doesn't. Knee stabilizes in both planes. And again, that gives him a stable base upon which to unload that rotation up the chain and ultimately out and around into the arm. So again, Paul Skeen, super exciting prospect to watch. We're excited to see where he goes in the draft. Excited to continue watching him as he ascends through his pro career. Uh, but just want to give my take on his mechanics. Hopefully you guys learned something, took something away from this video. And if you have any suggestions for a future breakdown, let me know down below in the comments. See you guys next time.